um, <clears throat> when I was uh, at my first church was in a community of less than 700 people. Uh, when I came to that church, I was brought by uh, one family, uh, an older couple, and then some of their, uh, well, they weren't that old because their, their children were not yet married. And so they had a, uh, they, they brought us there to, uh, and there was already a church building, but that church had closed twice. And uh, we were brought there with uh, Carol and I and our young family were brought there to um, uh, to minister to this this family, and, and the first thing they told us, and they, they told us, is that you need to understand the reputation of this church is terrible in the community. Um, the, the, you know, it, people just have such uh, uh, an, an awful feeling about it, and, and they say terrible things. And and I thought, okay, well, this is an interesting thing. Community of less than a thousand people, and reputation of the church is awful. So in my ignorance and exuberance, I started going to the houses, first of all, immediately around the church, and then spreading out into the community. I mean, obviously, a community that size, there were not a horrendous amount of uh, houses to go to. And I found out that the community didn't even know the church was there, let alone have a bad reputation. The only people that had a bad feeling about it were people from other churches that had been gossiping. Uh, plus people who used to be in the church who were part of the problem. So I <clears throat> but just going door to door, I found out that it was that was a that you know that the uh, the demographic that was portrayed to me was absolute nonsense. And uh, as I started going door to door, I found people that were just amazed that a pastor would actually come to them and ask them what they thought, ask them what they felt. And we had the privilege of seeing that church explode into life and people come to know Christ. And then the next community that I was in, <clears throat> the town itself was a metropolis of 2,300 people. And uh, in the immediate, uh, in, in the overall, in the total county, there were 12,000 people. And most of them, uh, uh, they, they shopped in one of two uh, business districts, another small town and this one. And uh, so probably... It was about 6,000 people that had this as their the the town of Brookings, Oregon, as their marketplace. And when I was brought there, the uh, the, the some of the people said, "Oh, you know, you're not going to be able to do much here." There's uh, I was brought there to with by a small group of people that had wanted to start a church, and people just kept saying, "Oh, no, it's just a community of old people. It's 65 to 75 percent retired." You're, you know. There, you know, you'll, you go to the churches around, you'll see they're all just full of just a handful of old people. And that was true. The churches just had a handful of old people. But as I started looking around, actually doing a survey, going into the newspaper, going into the school district, asking questions, I found out that the, uh, that the community was not 65 to 75 percent retired, but it was somewhere between 50 and 55 percent uh, retired population. That's a whole lot different. Uh, that's a whole uh, very much uh, different. And uh, so we were able to, once again, by by uh, asking around, starting to go to people's homes, we were able to find out that the that the community was not at all what we thought it was. The next community I went to was uh, uh, 17,000 people, and uh, the greater population of the county was 34,000 and we went there <clears throat> all the, in those 17,000 people the number of evangelical churches per capita was there was one evangelical church by that I mean a church that believed that the Word of God was inerrant the, uh, they believed in the fundamentals of the faith they believed in salvation by grace okay there's one evangelical church for every 700 people in that town um, and uh, so people were saying, well, you know, there's, there's there, you know, just I was being I was being brought in to uh, to uh, restart a church that was closing. People were saying, no, oh, just let that church close. There's there's no room for another church in town. So <clears throat> we closed the church and reopened it. And uh, what we uh, found out is that the same the same number of people were just moving from church to church, creating uh, you know, different types of storms of. Uh, of discontent, of malcontent, and uh, we decided that there we uh, that there were 
uh, plenty of sinners. We found out that the drug and alcohol problem was huge. We found that pregnancy issue in teenagers was huge. We found that the uh, uh, domestic violence was huge. And so after doing that, and once again, door to door, I started off going uh, from home to home to home and, uh, and going to the newspaper, going to the school districts, finding out who was there. And uh, as we found out who was there, we found that these were huge problems. So we uh, decided to not go and try and draw people from other churches. In fact, with the leaders, we started uh, gathering around. We said, we are going to discourage people from other churches. Uh, from coming here. Uh, we're going to ask them this question. We're going to ask them, uh, <clears throat> why did you leave your church? Uh, when you left your church, were your problems resolved? And if they were not resolved, we were going to say, you need to go back to your church and resolve your problems. Because the last thing we wanted to do is play the game that uh, of just having people uh, go from church to church. When we left there uh, four and a half years later, uh, the church had a, a full-time uh, associate pastor who became who became the pastor. The church was about 350 people. 65 percent of the people in the church had accepted Christ as Savior during those four and a half years. But what it boils down to is is that a person needs to exegete their culture. You need to find out what's there, and it's not just true for the inner city. You need to find out who's there. You need to find out what's there. You need to find out what the needs are. And that's what this is going to talk, be about today. Same thing happened when we went to the next place, which was a, uh, which was a city of one and a half million with a greater population of two and a half million. And so, <clears throat> we when we went there, this is a re, this is a, a retirement community. Same old story. You know, you're not going to find. I mean, you're just old people in the evangelical churches. There's nothing left. There's nobody out there. Well, we went and. Um, we found out, first of all, that 42% of the community were households uh, with children with single parents. That's not even counting. That's not even counting the, uh, the, the families that had both parents. So there are single, single parent households, 42% of the population, and they're just telling us, this is all old people here. That's all there is. We went to the school district, and they said this, you know, we were told, uh, this is a, a white community, but there's a real problem of Mexican gangs. Well, we went to the school district and we found out that the went to the high school and found out that 45 percent of the student body were Asian. <laughs> I mean, Christians and churches sit in these little boxes and they're clueless so often about who's there. They're just clueless. And uh, we, had a, we had a wonderful time there. I'm not going to tell the story. Just, just a, from the standpoint of talking about suburban and rural, uh, been there, you know, what did I say, been there, done that, got the shirt, got the hat, anyway, uh, for each one of those uh, size communities. And every single one of them was e enormously benefited by the, um, by the uh, simple processes and pr simple steps of exegeting those communities and those cultures, and by that simple process, we have this horrible tendency in the American church right now. And if it's not true in your church, great, that's wonderful. And uh, if you <clears throat> were to perhaps plant a church with us, we'd be thrilled if it was never true in a church that you planted. But this horrible tendency in the American church to think, well, we are here, we've got our building, if there's anybody in the community that uh, that needs feels a need for God, they can come to us. They can find us. That's a it's a failed concept. I mean, the all you have to do is look around the American church in general today and realize that whatever they're doing, it, it, you know, it, they churches have to ask the Dr. Phil question. How's that working for you? You know, they they have to ask. We have to ask that question, and we have to. Uh, be able to deal with with the uh, realities that that come out of asking ourselves that uh, very simple question from the standpoint of are we uh, are we relevant are are we just sitting there waiting for the church to come to us the church I'm working with right now I was asking just this last week I was asking the uh, the staff I was asking them and elders um, okay how this church at its at its zenith, at its at its absolute best moment, uh, how big a church was? Well, it was 800 to 1,000. And I said, how much is it now? 
And then the one one uh, guy that took the attendance stuff mumbled something, and I said, "What was that? 100 to 120." Okay, so 100 to 120. It used to be 800 to 1,000. I said, "So, 10 years ago, would you say that 10 years ago your basic service was a few hymns, announcements, offering the sermon?" Well, yeah. So, what's the basic basic ministry style now? Well. They split the, between the hymns and choruses, so they've got some choruses and some hymns, uh, offering announcements and a sermon. So I asked them the question, how's that working for you? And they didn't like it. Uh, then I went on to say, you are, um, are you going to be satisfied? So you're saying that you are satisfied because they were uh, kind of complaining about an outreach service that had uh, been attempted. I said, so you're saying that you're satisfied that this is going to be it. You're just going to wait for people to come here and say, there's a church building, that exact uh, thing that we have on the screen here. Here's a church building. They're going to find us if they want. You're going to be satisfied for that. You're, you're going to assume that doing the same thing the same way, you're going, to, you're going to find different results. Well, no, we're not saying that. One of the staff got so angry, he was out of his chair yelling. He was that angry. Uh, he said, we're not saying that. Well... I kept asking the question in different ways, and they were saying that. And I said, you, you guys, you have to recognize, you have to be shoved out of this box, and you have to find out who is here in your community, and the style of ministry has to be reinvented based on who is here now. Back when they started <clears throat> this particular style, this was on the outer edge of the city of Denver. Um, now it's a deep, I mean, you have to drive for <coughs> 10, 15 miles to find, a, you know, a, a, an empty field, or maybe not quite 15 miles, more like 10 miles to find a, a grassy field. I mean, that's uh, in any direction. It's just one of those things. It is no longer on the edge of the city. So what it <coughs> boils down to is we all have to, we have to take very seriously uh, on an ongoing basis, we have to go back out and we have to keep looking, keep asking, uh, and to, in order to be able to keep on being uh, relevant. Uh, we think that relevance is age or, or color skin or anything like that. No, there's a lot of other things that go into the whole issue of being relevant. We're going to take a look at the book of Acts to begin with in chapter 1, verse 8. In chapter 1, verse 8, uh, you see that Jesus is making a very clear statement to uh, his uh, 11 and, uh, and the 11 apostles at that point. They, uh, uh, he asked them if they're, uh, it says, you know, you, you know, go to the city and wait, of course, and then, uh, Holy, then the Holy Spirit's going to come on you, and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. Now, right there you see that there is going to be from, in, in the church, there's going to be uh, some diversity, because right off the bat he's saying, you know, Jerusalem was a very distinct order, a very distinct order of things. And he said, you know, you're, you're going to be witnesses for me, not just in Jerusalem, but also in Judea. Now, Judea was more more Romanized than Jerusalem was. Jerusalem had was uh, the Romans had allowed a lot of of uh, Jewish uh, distinction to stay in in Jerusalem itself, but Judea became more Romanized. Samaria, of course, had been populated by the Assyrians uh, with people from other countries that had intermarried with the Jews that had remained, and so it was uh, they were considered to be a half breed. They had their own temples and other stuff on the different uh, uh, in, in in their context, and so they were very very different. And so they, the, the gospel going to Samaria was definitely going to have some distinctives. And then the rest of the world, well, the rest of the world is the rest of the world, and uh, there would be all sorts of distinctives there. So right off the bat, they were told that the church was going to be diverse. Um, and, you know, looking at, at, the, at the, uh, some other verses in Acts in the first uh, six chapters, I'm not going to go beyond that, but uh, in this list in the first uh, six chapters, you see that the, the, the church, it worked well. It worked like it was supposed to work. Uh, in, in chapter 1, 3,000 were added. In, 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 in chapter 4, verse 1, we find that there's a, the, the total of men came to be 5,000, which meant there was probably 12 to 15,000 people altogether in the church by that point. And then you get to chapter, chapter uh, 5, verse 14, and it tells us that multitudes of both men and women 
multitudes of both men and women. This was not just a, you know, kind of a, a guys club type of thing just because of the, uh, uh, the, the statement earlier on in, in chapter 4, verse 4, about uh, that it grew to be 5,000 men. It wasn't just men. It was, it was women, children. Uh, and then you move on into chapter 6. And in chapter 6, it, it says, you know, he continues to tell us of all these people that were coming to know Christ. And notice it says, in Jerusalem. And then it also goes on to say that, that many of the priests were coming to believe. Okay, So what you have is that you have that the, that the, the going forward of the gospel in the Jerusalem church was doing well. Now, there are books I've read and, uh, and, and messages I've heard, and I have not researched this myself, uh, tell us that by the, by the event in Acts chapter 6 where Stephen is introduced, Chapter seven, he preaches his sermon that that gets the uh, gets the, uh, uh, the the synagogue so bent out of shape that they stone him to death at the end of uh, chapter seven, and then chapter eight, Paul Saul of Tarsus gets uh, 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 commissioned to uh, go after the church to persecute them. By this point, the end of chapter seven, beginning of chapter eight, that it may now be twelve years into the church. And there may be at this point about a quarter of a million Christians in Jerusalem by this point. So things were working really well in Jerusalem. But what about what about Acts chapter one, verse eight? Acts chapter one, verse eight said that they were going to go into uh, they were supposed to be going to Judea, Samaria, and was forth. Up through chapter seven. Judea and Samaria are not even mentioned, let alone the other parts, other most parts of the world. They're not even mentioned. Uh, outside of one place where it says that people were brought from Judea so that Peter's shadow could fall on them uh, so that they could be healed. Uh, and then in chapter 2 we find these people from all different parts of the world that came and were hearing the gospel in their own language, but there's nothing about Jesus said to them, you are the ones that are going to be witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, in the uttermost parts. And so what the church had opted for, it appears, was that, that these, these places were supposed to come to the church, come to them in Jerusalem. And in that, in that first dozen years, first quarter of a million saints uh, of, the, of the church were all in Jerusalem. No record at all of anybody leaving Jerusalem with the gospel. Until the first murder, the first uh, the first assassination of Stephen, and uh, as as the church's first martyr. After that, the persecution ramps up dramatically, and we find as chapter eight begins that the church starts going out of uh, Jerusalem into other parts. Uh, the first story is the story of Philip. Now I love the story of Philip. I believe there's one Philip in the scripture, and I, don't, I think the and it is Philip the. And the apostle in John chapter in John chapter one, we find the first thing that Philip did is he went and got Nathaniel. I mean, it was in his DNA. We find Philip's the one that bring, brings the, the Greeks to, to meet Jesus just before, not too long before, in the week just before his crucifixion. We find it's Philip that brings the little boy with the loaves of bread. I love this guy, Philip. We find that Philip uh, served on the uh, uh, in the, uh, in, in the, in the uh, dishing up of mashed potatoes in Acts chapter six. So this guy Philip goes to Samaria and in the gospel, and then he goes on, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch, and he goes on out into Judea. Later on, he, you know him as Philip the evangelist and the guy with all all the daughters who are prophets. Okay, so we find that that Philip goes out, and he he's the first story that's told of going out. Um, the persecution in Jerusalem, and I will verify this in a minute. The persecution in Jerusalem forced the church out of their box forced them to start obeying what they were told to do in going out. Now, what they were doing was right, and God still would have blessed it the way he blessed it, but they weren't going out as they were told to do. They stayed there, and God used persecution to force them out. So then Peter and John then go to Samaria after, uh, after Philip goes to Samaria, and uh, Peter and John uh, go there, and, and, and the Lord uses Peter uh, to... Uh, be there for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the on the Samaritans, 
and then and you find that Peter then goes to uh, out into Judea, and that that's where he ends up being uh, uh, with the story of Cornelius and and uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles for the first time. Then you get into chapter eleven, and in chapter eleven, uh, the the uh, the church leaders back in Jerusalem are now bent because. The gospel has been preached to the Samaritans and has been preached to the Gentiles, and they've received the Spirit exactly the same way that the early church did. And now the church is bent, and they they call this uh, this this meeting to discuss it. And Peter tells the story. And fortunately, Peter had a bunch of guys went with him, and they all saw it. I got to tell you, I've been around the church long enough to know that even though Peter was Peter, he was the great mouth Peter. They probably would have doubted him, or doubted that he knew what he saw if there had been witnesses. Just, just saying, just saying. That's the way it works. But there were witnesses. Okay, so the church says, okay, this is the way it's going to be. The the gospel is able to be presented to the Gentiles uh, without them first becoming uh, proselytes. So they 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 accept that. Okay, so now we're in chapter eleven. And we've gone through X chapters 1 through 11 and, and verse 18. And now we're at X chapter 11 verses 9 through 21. And notice this is where things really start breaking loose. And notice in verse 19, excuse me, 19 through 21, in uh, verse 19, notice how there were people that went out and they went into Phoenicia and to uh, and, 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 and to these other uh, places preaching the gospel. But notice in verse 19, where did they, when they went to these other places preaching the gospel, who were they preaching to? Jews only. So even though, and it says that these people were dispersed because of the persecution with Stephen. It says right there in verse 19. So I wasn't making that up. God was shoving the church out of Jerusalem, shoving them out of their comfort zone, shoving them out of their box, because they were not following through in the diversification of the church that he had stated clearly in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. They were not following the diversification of the church as they were told that it was intended to be. So they, they be, they're forced out by the persecution. When they go to these other places, they're, all they're doing is preaching to the same to the Jews. Then we get to verse 19 and 19. Uh, uh, I'm excuse me, verse 20 and 21 are, are these are some of my favorite verses in the whole 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 Bible. And in these verses, we see some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyprus, uh, of course, is the island, and then Cyrene is uh, is in, in Libya. It's in Africa. Men that were not from the Jerusalem box. They weren't from the Jerusalem box. There were men that, were, that had grown up and had lived outside of the box. These men, they go up to Antioch in verse uh, 20. They go to Antioch and look what they do. I like the translation that I use. They began to speak to the Greeks. These men from outside of the box, they go and they begin to speak to the Greeks. Exegeting culture is this verse right here. It's going outside of the box and beginning to speak to the Greeks. We have to figure out as local churches how to speak to the Greeks. If we don't figure that out, we will continue to be irrelevant. We'll go down and down and down until we hear, uh, we circle the drain and hear that great sucking noise. And we go into oblivion because God will, and during that process, you will find, we will find, that God will bring things on the church, on the local church, to force them out of the box. Just like he did to the early church in Jerusalem. He brought persecution on. And he can bring very, very hard times on the local church to force them out of the box, to get them to stop just sitting around looking at each other, finding fault with each other, but to go to the windows and to look, to look outside, lift up their eyes to the fields, they're white for harvest, to get the churches to start looking outside and finding out who's there, to get out of the fortress and find out who who is there and is going to be uh, a part of what God. And then, of course, you look at uh, then at verse 21. What happened? These guys 
outside the box, from outside the box, that went outside, even more outside the box, that began to speak to the Greeks. And you know what? God is with them. God is with them. And many people came to know Christ. What it boils down to is this is what is going to happen for any of us who prompted and inspired by the Holy Spirit leave the box and go outside the church walls into the neighborhood of the church and begin to speak to the Greeks. I think Dr. Feuder mentioned the theology of place. Well, each one of our local churches are located in a place. It is the strategy of somebody being there in that particular spot um, in those acres to harvest and to cultivate those acres. It's a strategic placement, the theology of place. As churches, we are there. You're there and my there and the other is there. But it is, it is the theology of place. Now, it doesn't matter what church it is, evangelical church, whether it's brand new, whether it's like this church I'm helping right now, it's 135 years old. It doesn't matter which it is, but any church, any church can get to the spot, and that's what we're going to be talking about now. We're going to be talking about some things uh, that allow the church, it's a layered, it's a layered approach, it's a layered approach to reaching the world. Uh, that in, any church can do. Uh, it, it, it takes some. It takes some. Uh, some people thinking outside the box and stepping outside the box. But any church can do. That'll lead them outside of the box of their comfort zone and of their church building into the community. And the uh, the first of the of this layered approach is a concerted and sincere effort for prayer. <clears throat> and I'm going to say. This, with all, with all sincerity, kindness, love, and all the rest of that, all the rest of that good stuff. If you think you can do it, if you can think you can reach your world, you are wrong. You can't do it. If you think you're unworthy, you're right. You're unworthy. What what was? See, only God saves. Only God saves, and, and and if we are not if we are not praying, if we are not engaged in in a strategic prayer, we've had the spiritual warfare module, we've had the prayer module. If we are not engaged in strategic prayer, uh, nothing is going to happen. Efforts will burn out. The people of the church will burn out. Uh, the, the the church will follow dumb ideas. The church will follow something that some other church did, and it may have worked for them in Chicago, but it might not work in your town of 4,000 people. As churches, we have to recognize that we have to pray. As individuals, we have to pray. And you don't wait until you can get everybody praying. You pray with those who will pray. Uh, John Feuder in the earlier sessions mentioned Esther and how she became frantic and called for fasting and praying for several days. Uh, he talked about Nehemiah and how Nehemiah, uh, he prayed to the God of heaven. And we find in both chapters 1 and 2 of Nehemiah praying and how his prayer. And we, of course, the story of Daniel and his prayers. And uh, these, these three individuals, Esther, Nehemiah, and Daniel, how their prayers moved the hearts of the most powerful people on earth. The most powerful kings, the kings that were then the rulers of the world, their prayers moved their hearts. You know, that famous verse, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man is in James chapter 5, and it's a verse just before it tells the story of, of uh, Elijah as a man just like us. And when he prayed that the rain would stop, it stopped raining. For three years, it stopped raining. When he prayed again, it started raining. What God is saying is that your prayer means something. Your prayers mean something. They mean a horrendous and huge.
huge amount. And, and, and if we think we can, if we think that we can go outside of our little comfortable box and go out into the world without being saturated with prayer, we, we, we really will mess up. We will screw up. It's a, it's a dangerous and hostile world out there. But if we go, uh, if we if we go in the power of the Spirit and and uh, garrisoned by God's uh, by God's grace and power, we will we'll do marvelously. I mean, remember, God's goal is that the earth be filled with His glory. That's His goal. So we're working according to His passion that the earth be filled with His glory. So prayer is absolutely fundamental to this process, and, and just I, I, I can't say enough about it. We we did we had the full module on prayer, the full module on spiritual warfare. Uh, I can't spend a whole lot of time on it in this, but this is where it needs to go first. If you want to get outside of the box of your church, outside of the box of your comfort zone, and if you want to think outside the box and pray. Uh, I, I haven't heard the recent statistic, but that statistic has been around for a few years, and I doubt it has gotten any better. That the average pastor in America prays for seven minutes uh, a day. I doubt it's gotten any better. Uh, the devil's been tricking and, uh, and and keeping pastors from praying and people in ministry from praying for years, and uh, he's gotten very good at it. That just won't do. That won't do. So if, if you're sincere, if our, we in our churches are sincere about getting outside the box, we've got to hit the prayer thing first, right? Secondly is what I call Platform Sundays. Now, Platform Sundays are based on exegeting the congregation that you have. Remember the word exegeting is to divide, or even in some uses in the Greek it's to cut or to slice to separate and divide, to, to understand, to, to dissect and understand what, the, what your local church is made of. And in that process, Platform Sunday start off by reaching those people that without any effort you already have relationship contacts with, such as family members and uh, close co-workers and friends. Platform Sundays are designed to be able to step uh, to help you start stepping out of the box by first of all reaching those uh, reaching out to those who are already within the reach of people that are already within the congregation and uh, so platform Sundays are Sundays that are very helpful where <clears throat> and they may or may not be directly tied to but they're uh, the simplest ways to directly tie them to uh, to days that the uh, uh, to to Sundays that the uh, that the whole community already honors, such as Mother's Day, Father's Day, um, Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas, New Year's, the, the days that are already honored by the community to take those Sundays and to uh, step outside of the norm of <clears throat> three choruses, offering an announcements, uh, a hymn, and, uh, and then a sermon. Step outside of that, that template Step outside of the template and have testimonies and have <clears throat> have a sermon that is no more than 10 to 15 minutes long. If you if you insist on having a sermon, um, uh, wrap the <clears throat> take and create a service. That the, the purpose for the service is so that the people of the church can know that on these on these platform Sundays where the day becomes the platform, Mother's Day becomes the platform for that service. Father's Day becomes the platform for that service. So that we're so that on these platform Sundays, that they will they will know that the church is not going to be three choruses, uh, announcements and offering, a hymn and a sermon. They'll know it's not they'll know it's gonna be different. So they will know weeks in advance, months in advance, to start inviting people to come with them on that platform Sunday. That's the purpose for Platform Sundays is to is to be able to have a place where where the friends uh, where people can bring their friends and the and the people that are that are part of their their, their family experience without thinking oh no they're going to get a sermon and maybe they're going to get yelled at 
something that is going to be uh, uh, uplifting and will have the claims of Christ in it somewhere, but it will be done in such a manner that it is a, that it's sliding in as something refreshing. Platform Sundays, and, and see that's, that comes out of exegeting and saying, well, in our own church we, have the, we already have reach to these people. We don't have to reach way out in outreach. We already have reach to these people. So you, you develop your platform Sunday, and it may not be a uh, Mother's Day or Christmas Eve or whatever. Uh, it, it may be a platform that you create specifically that people know that every year, <clears throat> every year on on, uh, on May 1st, we're going to have a we're going to have a platform Sunday. So the people, the church, know what, whatever the platform, whatever, whatever makes sense. Whatever makes sense to uh, your body of believers, and so you start off, start off with platform settings. You see how hard is that? It, it doesn't. It hardly costs a thing. It probably will not even cost uh, any more unless maybe you buy a couple of uh, of the skit guide video clips or something to to be used in the service. It's it's not going to be a whole lot of extra expense. The next thing, the next thing is to uh, have a have a. Um, uh, we find that there's this group of people called the ex-church. Uh, the ex-church, they're people that uh, uh, used to have a relationship with the church, either by knowing Christ as Savior, or used to have a relationship, maybe they were, brought, they were raised in a raised in a church until they were junior hires and they left church, but they really have some regard for the church. And, and these people can be found uh, by 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 going door to door. Now a door to door plan, there are so many people who say, oh, I can't do door to door anymore. We have two Mormon uh, cohorts going right now. And, uh, you know, I know some people I've heard uh, from pastors there say, oh, no, you can't go door to door in Mormon country because they do that. Well, do it back. I mean, why? Uh, door to door is one of your best ways for both, uh, for, for learning a lot of things about your community. I mean, somebody's got to break the mold and step outside the box. I mean, what else? Are you, how else you can get outside the box if you're not going to do this? Now, the, this, this, the, the ex-church will also respond to some advertising. Uh, but you have to be prepared for, for what you're looking for. Now, the ex-church, they have, they have been in the church. They're outside the church. They were either felt uncomfortable because they did something in their lives that made them feel bad, or maybe they just got disillusioned, or maybe they never were saved. And they're outside of the church. Uh, what you, what we do with the ex churches when, when we, uh, we have certain things that we know that they will respond to. The ex church will come back into a church, absolutely without any hesitation, for things that address their specific needs. So when we go out and we prepare a church to go out, we have them first of all work on establishing things such as a recovery group. A, an addictions recovery group, a divorce recovery group, um, a, uh, a loss or grief recovery group. Very simple things to do. There's tons of materials, DVDs and all sorts of things on all of those issues. But if, if you, the, the, the ex-church will, without any hesitation, walk back into a church building if there's something that's addressing their needs. They're not afraid of the church. They're not afraid of the church as such. They will walk back in if, we're, if their needs are being addressed. So in going door to door, uh, it doesn't matter. Remember, I've done it in all these communities, uh, from, from a community of less than 700 to a community of, uh, of uh, one and a half million. I've done it in all these communities. And, and it, 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 it flat out still works. The, the only one place that it's the hardest is where you have uh, extreme wealth and where you have uh, uh, gates and, and bars and security. But other than that, anywhere, upper middle class, it, it does not matter. Uh, there is a way to go in there and to be able to know. We always go in and we don't go in with a, a, to lie at the door. Uh, so many people go to lie at the door. They lie. They say, we're, we're here to conduct a survey, or we're here to ask some, some questions. And then what they're trying to do is they're trying to get their foot in the door so they can preach the gospel. And they'll have all, <clears throat> a whole bunch of materials with them and stuff to be able to preach the gospel. You know, good intent, but they lie to try and get there. And those two don't go together, folks. Those two things do not go together. You don't lie to preach the gospel. 
So you go to the door sincerely to ask, and we the last the recent one we the most recent one I participated in, and uh, and hit it up, and it was uh, in a very difficult uh, kind of a housing project, and we went door to door, and we uh, we introduced ourselves, and we said uh, we we want to know we're from that uh, church group that meets in the clubhouse, and uh, we want to know what you think churches ought to be doing, churches like ourselves ought to be doing, to be able to. Uh, to be able to care for the community, what do you, what's your opinion of what we ought to be doing? Uh, we never found hostility uh, where uh, there there were people that as soon as we mentioned that we were from some church that uh, wanted to start t shutting the door. But when we said, look, all we're here to do is to get your opinion, uh, people want to talk about their opinion, and we would ask their opinion, and uh, we'd uh, and but by doing this. Uh, we already knew that we had a recovery group. We already knew these various things that we already had. And if, and if, and if we found out and somebody said, oh, you need to have a kids club. Oh, you know, we do have a kids club. And, uh, the, and the kids club, ought to get, well, we actually do that. Uh, you need to be feeding the community. Don't you remember last week's barbecue? The, the big, oh, that was you guys. Yeah, that was us. Well, what it boils down to is that if you already have some stuff that uh, – it is already happening. You've prepared yourself for it. Those who are ex-church, when they find out that you are uh, that you are already addressing these issues, they will come, and they are you 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 trawl first of all for the ex-church. Um, you 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 drop your lines and you and you with hooks on them, and you're you're trying you're trawling for the ex-church, and you do that by those targeted need-based groups, and you. Get the word out. You can use advertising uh, for this particular group. You can, but you have to have those other things in place. And then you, but door to door also allows you to find them and tell them that you already have that. And if they've already met you and they, they find out that you already have that, uh, and they're not afraid of going to the church because they used to be in the church, uh, it is it is not that hard. That's where I, I, every one of the church plants, the the biggest part of growth happened right there. The next. Uh, part of growth comes off of those exact same people. Those people that were ex-church <clears throat> have tons of friends that uh, that that are ex that, that uh, maybe have never been in a church. They are knocked down, drag out uh, 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 pagans, but they're friends with the ex-church. They watch the person who's ex-church. They watch their lives change. They watch their language clean up. They watch how they treat their family. They watch their integrity, and all of a sudden they're wanting to know, what's up? What's up with you? Why are you changing? What's different? And so the ex-church are the very, very best at bringing in the totally lost. And they will usually bring them into the same things that they attended, the recovery groups, the, the, the uh, targeted need-based groups. Those are so, <clears throat> so helpful in the overall uh, process of being able to uh, reach <clears throat> reach the uh, community as we uh, as 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 you know the church tries to go forward in outreach. There, the next thing, and we we don't have time. We will sort of come back to some of this as we go along. The next thing is the uh, the, the multicultural aspect of of what is out there and what the what the needs are. The multicultural aspect, it, and and again by door to you can find out who's out there. On this multicultural aspect, you start off with with who is within your within your body of believers. Um, if <clears throat> if you have uh, you know like in this one church we we had some we had some African American um, white mixed race couples. Uh, we had some uh, Latinos and uh, and then we had Anglo's. And so we we started with what with what we have. You start with what you have. And you reach out. Now the Latino part did so well <clears throat> that they went away down the road about a uh, mile and a half, two miles, and started a church. It worked really, really well. Uh, and and the and then we 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 had experienced quite a bit of growth, and we had other uh, nationalities and other groups within us within our group. But you find them again as you go door to door. You find out who's there. You ask them questions. Ask them questions about their cultures, about their celebrations. You learn about them. 
and, and the, your, your best way to be able to reach them. And every one of our communities is changing in this area. Every, it doesn't matter what community it is, people from other, other parts of the world that are moving into your community. And God will give you wisdom as you find out that they are there. Um, sometimes even if you have no, no one in the church who has any rapport with a community of, of somebody that you've just met, the fact that you are taking the time as an American, as a white American, or as an African American American, or as a, as a, a second or third generation Spanish American, if they find that you, as a person who is historically from the United States, are reaching out to them and want to know about them, very seldom do they want to shut the door on you. Most of the time, they are so amazed that you are reaching out to them and that you're wanting to learn from them. It takes some time, but learning from them is how they open their hearts to us. The next thing is, is the, the straightforward uh, needs survey, community needs survey. Uh, and with a community needs survey, it is a very specific thing. You can buy uh, the document for a number of different uh, kind of folders. Uh, for community need surveys, and uh, you can do a community need survey, uh, survey, uh, and you can go through all the processes, and you talk to all the people, all the all the stakeholders who are already there in different areas of uh, of the of community need. You can talk to all of them, um, and that's one way. The other way is you just go and you say, "I'm from such and such a church." You go to a school, you go to you go to the uh, to social workers, you go to various ones that are in the area doing various things. You find everybody you can. You go to the mayor. You go to the city planner. You say, I'm from such and such a church. And we are wanting to find out what the needs are in this community. They all want help with needs. What are the needs? Who's hurting? What are the areas that are being addressed? What are What's not being addressed? And what a church looks for is that area, that, 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 that niche that they can take and they can that they can uh, bring value added to the community, make the community better because they're there, and to start dressing that need. See, it goes on and on and on. There's so many opportunities that are out there, but you go out and you ask. And again, <clears throat> your school, your schools are some of the best places to find out who's there, and to find out what's, what what the needs are. And and uh, almost all the state and city and school, they are all desperate for more help. Uh, Go uh, from the standpoint of wanting to, to preach the gospel. Remember, Jesus met a lot of needs before he made, made his claims in a lot of situations. He didn't make his claims until after he had met needs. And the church needs to uh, be uh, willing to, to address this. Now, a couple scriptures that uh, kind of will wrap this up for us today. A couple of scriptures that kind of uh, speak to this. is the, First of all, Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 13. In Matthew chapter nine verse thirteen, Jesus says to the uh, says to the uh, uh, Pharisees who were upset with him, he says to them, "Now go find out what this means. Uh, you know that that, that uh, God desires, and in some of your translations it says mercy, and in uh, the New American Standard it says desires compassion, not sacrifice. We need to find out. I see as as the church, are we known? Where are we known for our compassion? As the body of Christ, as your local assembly, are you known for compassion? You know, go find out what this means. He desires, I mean, the sacrifice was, you had the, you had the, the patriarchs, you had the tabernacle, you had the temple, you had all of that stuff in here. Jesus is saying what God really looks for, what God is really looking for, is he's looking for compassion, not sacrifice. Sacrifice is important, but not without compassion. Our churches, we can, we can, we can get men with great and impressive theological degrees to espouse uh, regurgitated seminary notes every week, and and, and you know, and and we can we can uh, you know, talk about tithes. We can do all sorts of stuff. We can. Uh, I uh, send, send people on short-term missionary trips. But after all is said and done, God says he's desiring compassion. 
I was talking to a friend yesterday morning at breakfast, and he was telling me about it. He got a text, emergency text during breakfast from his church. And he told me what the whole situation was behind it. And I told him, I said, Kevin, I'm so, sometimes I'm so embarrassed. I said, I talk compassion and compassion and compassion. I have illustrations and I have um, anecdotes and scriptures. But when I hear about certain types of needs, I shut down. I think, yeah, there you go. There's somebody that's just looking for a handout. Somebody who's screwed their lives up so badly, they're just looking for somebody to be a safety net. And my compassion, boom, out the window. What it boils down to is compassion is messy, folks. Compassion is messy. Um, but the church will best reach those who have, who have visibly messy lives. Those who have messy lives that are covered up will respond after they have seen those with visibly messy lives cleaning up. The next verse there is a familiar verse to some. Uh, a lot of people take this passage in Isaiah 58 and they try and teach fasting from it. It is really strange that this is used to try and teach that you should fast. <coughs> this passage is actually saying, you know, you guys are so screwing up with your fasts. You're such hypocrites in these things you call fasts. And then this uh, little section out of it that we have here, verses 6 through 8, uh, he says, you know, is not this a fast? And notice that in verse 6, he talks about breaking bonds, helping people be set free. Uh, for me, that's, that's, I mean, one in four Americans, adult Americans, one in four adults in America is addicted to a controlled substance. One in four is addicted to a controlled substance. Uh, the, the role of the church, the real fast, is being out there helping the people who are in bondage be set free. And then it talks about the poor. And then in verse 8 it says that these things, uh, when, when you are doing this, you no longer are just doing church and, and, uh, and feeling the drudgery of doing church. But you feel like, ah, wow, this is, this is ministry. I've seen people who've had their first experiences that, that, that almost want to jump and scream with joy because they've had their first experiences in seeing the reality of lives changed. It just makes them want to bust their buttons. Now I want to ask you if Matthew 11, 28 and 29, very, very familiar verse, would be a description of if, if, if Jesus, if we are to be his, his body, and uh, we are to be Christ in our community. Would our church actually be able to say this? Could, could your church, my church, say, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will I'll give you rest. I mean, can, can we actually, if we are being Christ to our community, does your church in any way, in any way actually afford the possibility of finding rest, other than coming down on a Sunday morning uh, uh, and, um, and saying a prayer and <clears throat> maybe being lined up for some discipline. Does it really, is there a sense that, see, that the church in America is no longer perceived as a place where people can find relief and healing for their lives? It's not perceived as that anymore. That's not where people go to find help. So when our churches become those, when our churches become that which people within the church just consider, we are here. You can find us, and if you've got a spiritual need, come look for us. That is what the mindset has become, but it's a failed mindset. We must go out of our boxes, or or God will shove us out of our boxes. I believe that. I've seen it over and over again. Some of the churches out there, why are we in such turmoil? Well, it's because God's trying to shove you out of your box. Find out who's in your community. 
prayerfully find out who's in your community. Be wise. Figure out ways to be able to reach those that you find are there. Lord, we come to you at the end of this day of, of uh, looking at the methods to rethink our outreach to community. As we look at the methods and the, and the procedures and the processes, all the teaching that John gave us earlier on, and then as we apply this to our more uh, suburban and rural contexts, Lord, I pray that you will actually help us to um, take steps forward. Lord, we know of uh, churches that after this session two years ago actually made strides because they, there were some people within these cohorts that said, let's get her done. So, Lord, I just pray for very positive things to come from this day of study. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and go to your final discussion time for the day. Thank you.